so my dissertation wasn't really difficult to figure out. I've been in, I've taught rights of passage, I've directed rights of passage programs as well. I was like, what can I write that, you know, when I'm dust will have meaning? What can I write that is relevant to yesterday, today, and tomorrow? And so it was the topic of rites of passage. And so what I did in the dissertation, which is available online for free, you can find it. Um, it's on um, a WordPress that is outdated, but it's still I need to update it. It's uh, secondcivilrightsmovement.wordpress.com. By second civil rights, I'm talking about the underfunding of um, black schools and mm -hmm. um, the marginalization of educational needs of young black people. I call it second civil rights movement because it's segregation is not over. You know, it's just a, it's taking different forms. But so what I found out in my dissertation studies, which like so, it's stuff that we know, you know, and anybody that's right. serious about our culture already knows that rights of passage is critical, is essential, is core to properly raising youth to become adults. And rights of passage is really it's a part of the human process. Like it to to be human is to educate your young people. And what slavery did was it well what slavery attempted to do was to take our humanity away. When you take away the processes that people use to educate their children, you're not only taking their culture away, you're trying to take away their very humanity as a people. You're taking the essence of who they are away. So we know without studies that rights of passage is essential to teaching our youth into being adults responsible and accountable to the needs of their community. That's what rights of passage mm -hmm. is. And I just, right. I just was able to crunch it down into numbers. And what I found is that the older children get, as children mature, as the maturation process takes place from uh, uh, um, teenagers becoming young adults, the high school years, our young people go through a dematuration process in that they become more antisocial even if right. they are in school because of the things that they are exposed to. And the youth that were in the rites of passage programs tended to have statistically more pro-social behaviors. And how did I measure that? I measured that by, um, by, by exposure to drug use, exposure to gangs, which then will have an right. impact on school, on school performance. And what I found is that because the, I, the schools that I conducted my study in, it was two different schools, the schools that where I conducted the studies, um, seniors that had transferred in that had never been in rights of passage programs were had more antisocial behavior tendencies than freshmen who had been in middle school rights of passage that programs who had more pro social behavior. So it's a, it's it's clear as day shows that rights of passage makes a difference. So my argument is this I'm uh, my, my argument is that rights of passage is and should be considered the missing core subject in education. We think of the core right. subject as reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, science, literature. Right. Well, those are not the only core subjects. You could even argue that those are not core subjects. The core, the core subject is coming of age. How do we teach people to come of age? And we do not have rites of passage across the board in schools. We don't have, we're, not, we're not teaching the coming of age process. And so if my studies are right and I crunch the numbers, what it's saying is that children are going through a dematuration process. You know, what, what Carter G. Wilson called miseducation. Mm -hmm. The longer they stay in school, the longer they stay in school, the more de-educated, the more miseducated they become, the more... That's true. Uh, the more the dematuration process is taking place. That's what I found. So what's happening in schools is a crime. And, you know, it's going to take organizations, yeah. it's going to take parents, it's going to take pressure to change that. But we, we can't allow it. You know, it, 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 it has to stop. Children are not being educated right. in school. They're, they're being so, uh, 
de-educated. Now, with that being said, that that because I, I like that because I I do agree with what you're saying about um, the purpose of the rites of passage. Um, that's why I wanted you to expound on that because um, I I was I wasn't in in a specific rites of passage program, but being in um, I was a part of a drill team growing up, uh, playing football, baseball, playing sports, and my coaches yeah. being black men. So I was exposed to. I was exposed to black men um, as coaches, black women, and a few black men were my teachers. Like I, I wanted a few black people in America who had a, a handful of white teachers uh, throughout my educational uh, life. So, uh, so I get, I get the their need for rites of passage and the, and the value in it. Now, um, that 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 was your dissertation. You successfully defended that, but. But I, I do want to know, um, you like I say, you you got your bachelor's, you earned your bachelor's, you earned your master's, you earned your doctorate degree. Um, as you were walking across the stage and and just just looking back on where you could have been to where you were, to where you were in that moment walking across with three degrees, like what were the emotions that you had? What were the thoughts going through your mind knowing that? You made the right decisions, and you were able to turn your life around. And it, you could have gone, you could have continued and going in the streets, but you didn't. So, how did that make you feel about yourself, and, and what was going through your mind at the time? Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, I'm as a little funny. I'll tell you where I'm laughing in a second. But your process, what you just described, is an informal right to passage. It, it's mm-hmm. you, what you went through was not a a specific particular right to passage, but what you went through is what we have to make the norm. We, right. it, but what you, your, your coming of age processes must be the norm where young people are exposed to positive role models who teach them. Your coaches taught you more than just football. They, exactly. they taught you about manhood. They taught you about being stand up and having good character. So we have to expose our young people to those experiences, and it has to be the norm, right? Yeah. And so what, what I went through with my mentor, David McCaskill, who, my counselor who became my mentor, who became my father figure, that was the informal right to passage, but it has to be the norm. Mm-hmm. We, have to, we have to institute those experiences. We have to put policies in place to make sure that all of our children go through those experiences. And we see the outcome. You and I are testaments to it. You know, we have different paths, but in the end, we both became, you know, um, men who are committed to our communities, which is normal. Right. It's not radical, you know. Right. It's considered radical, but I think that that's wrong. But um, so I'm laughing about the question because um, when I graduated high school, I didn't. I didn't walk the stage because I was uh, dealing with, um, you know, living on my own at that time. Mm-hmm. I had, to, I, you know, home wasn't an, uh, a possibility for me. I, I was dealing with, you know, um, being a a, a a young adult and you know having my own place. And so I, I didn't walk. I had bills to pay. <laughs> um, right. And I got uh, two masters, and I didn't walk with those either. Mm-hmm. I didn't walk with my bachelor's. Uh, I, I, the two ceremonies that I walked, I walked in high school and I walked for my doctorate. Um, right. High school was, that was something, bro. That was that was really something. David McCaskill was there. My mom, uh, a couple of my siblings were there. Um, but I, I had a conversation with one of my uh, guy I played basketball with in high school and um, he had decided that he wasn't going to college. And I don't know if he was saying that trade school was an option. He was just like, I'm just not going. And I was like, bro, I don't have a choice. You know, I, I, I got to go, man. And um, I just didn't think that that would be me. Like, what I saw of myself was, you know, one of my best friends, uh, uh, Marnez Jones, he was, he was shot dead. He was 16 years old. Uh, another good friend of mine, uh, Orlando, we call him Dodo, he was shot dead, uh, you know, what, like 17 years old. 
And, um, mm-hmm. you know, many more, man, like, you know, a lot of them that um, I could just keep going down the list, you know, brothers that I knew, a uh, good friend of mine and, and he went to jail for double murder as a teenager, you know. Um, another brother of mine went down for life. So um, I saw that as me, you know, uh, um, family members all, uh, many of them, the men in my family, like drug addicts and or dealers and, um, you know, and my father, you know, an addict as well, who, who, I mean, wasn't in my life, but I knew I knew him well enough to know that he was an addict. And um, right. so I saw that as me, man. You know, I, like, I didn't see anything beyond that because that, that was my exposure. So um, it was, like, surreal. You know, I just... I couldn't believe it. Like I was, I'm actually walking across the stage. And um, when I went to, when I enrolled in Chicago State University, that was my first time walking on the campus. <laughs> you know? um, wow. I went to Kennedy. I went to a junior college first. When I got to junior college, everybody was going to the university, to mm-hmm. Chicago State. And I'm like, well, if everybody's going out, I guess I need to go there. And the very first, I believe that's, well, no, let me see. Uh, I, I attended a wedding ceremony at the university. But other than that, I, don't, I, I can't remember even ever walking on a university campus. So when I, I enrolled right. there, and um, I just had, you know, some things going on. And, you know, I'm, like, focused. I'm researching and reading when I'm getting those other degrees. Um, but I knew I needed to walk for the doctorate. And um, I dealt with some racism at Gwinnett Mercy. You know, there's one professor, this lady, she, uh, you know, I had fallen ill uh, during one of the courses, and she was like, well, maybe you should withdraw. And I'm looking at her like, if I was your son. Wow, you you wouldn't say that, right. Even if I wasn't your son, if if I was just white, period, would you be telling me that? So she said, she's going to give me some makeup work. And uh, Oh, and I didn't, my books were not mailed on time either. My books were not mailed. I was sick, and I was telling her, I'm going to complete your course, and I'm going to pass. She was like, no, nah, I think this might be too much for you. So she gave me, like, weeks of makeup. I did all of her makeup work. I did all of the work that I would have had to do if I wasn't sick, and I finished everything, like, two weeks early. <laughs> and wow, see, I yeah, walked. so hard. <laughs> yeah, and she right. was there when I walked, and she looked That's at good. me, and I looked at her. She knew what I was thinking. I knew what she was thinking. <laughs> now, that's cool. Yeah. Now, yeah. And see, one of the reasons why I asked that question is I'm, I, I I don't like school. I, I didn't enjoy being in school. Like, the funnest thing to me was, like, P.E., lunch, and things. College was cool, yeah. uh, being able to, to get an African-centered education. That was, the, that was basically the highlight Where'd of my education career. In college, getting an African-centered education but everything where, else, I was go? I didn't really enjoy it. Right. Where Where did you go? Oh, um, I went to FAMU. I got uh, my bachelor's in psychology from FAMU, and you know, FAMU has the only African centered um, psychology program in the country. And right. so I didn't know that when I enrolled. Say you know again. Name Akbar. What university was he in? You do you know? Uh, Florida State, yeah, because he actually lives here in Tallahassee. Uh, and his son, oh, I know his son. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Naeem Akbar was at Florida State. Yeah, and so they, um, I, I know they, they Naeem Akbar has done a lot of work here, and they, him and his son do a lot of work in a, a, a part of town called Frenchtown, which is like a historically black part of town. So, yeah, I'm familiar with them. And like I say, his book, his book is one of my favorite books. So. Yeah, yeah, that that was one of the first yeah. books I read, man, that, like, just turned light bulbs on. I, right. I think David, so, we, he sent me the book. He sent me that one first. Yeah, like, that was yeah, like that's a good one. That's a classic. Yeah. All right, so in addition to your academic success, you you overcoming a lot of things. You also um, are a martial artist. You, um, you're a black belt in martial arts. And you was able to create your own system. It's called Maatsumu. Uh, yeah. Did I pronounce it correct? Maatsumu, yeah. Maatsumu. So, um, what is Maatsumu, and like, how did you come up with the creation of it? Right. So, uh, at first, Maatsumu, Maat, of course, is the uh, comedic 
ancient Egyptian uh, deity, um, mm-hmm. who is my is also my uh, spiritual lifestyle. You know, mm-hmm. I don't subscribe to organized religions. I mean, if people do, you know, you you do what works for you. Um, but my my is my lifestyle, is my spirituality. Um, so, but I wanted something. So, like, my eye is like how we should all live. But then you right. have to, unfortunately, sometimes be prepared to defend ourselves. We have to be prepared to um, sustain our lives in some cases. Um, and that's where sumo comes in. And the people think that it's sumo, like the sumo wrestler, but it's Kiswahili. Sumo means venom or poison in Kiswahili. So you're okay. saying, um, you're saying, you're, you're saying, I have the things. I'm striving for the things to keep balance of my eye in my life, but I'm also prepared. You know, I have poison on these arrows if I need to. <laughs> you know, I got poison on the tips of these blades if I need to use them. So um, it was about 2000 in Chicago that I started. I, well, I mean, I grew up fighting. You know, I, I knew you, in my neighborhood you had to know how to throw your hands. You know, you had to know how to use the hands. Right. So and plus I had little sisters and little brothers on top of that. So, um, so I had some I had some little street skills, uh, but in 2000 I became interested in um, definitely um, professional boxing, but martial arts as well. So if you talk about 2000, you, you remember you know you had the, the Gracie families, the Shamrock. You had these guys right. in the UFC. Right making head with making names. So I, I became interested in defense. And so I started studying on my own. I moved to Philly in 2002. By that time, I had trained a couple of people. Well, really, people just trained with me. I, I wouldn't say that I was right. teaching them. But I was just trying to learn some things. I considered 2000 to be the founding of my Samu, though, although I didn't use the name until later when I got to Philly. Um, but that's really it was I once I started studying my studying was like intense like I I became just intrigued with the art and you know the mechanics of the of of the defense. So um, I not only I considered I I went to, I had a couple of boxing trainers so I incorporated boxing into it. And then I started training with some brothers that were black belts and brown belts in different systems. A uh, couple right. brothers black belts in judo, a couple brothers had belts in uh, karate and other systems, jiu-jitsu. And I wasn't in any particular system, but I pulled these brothers together. And I figured, you know what, I, I, what we need to do is formalize our own system and incorporate what I felt the best of the best of all of those systems. Also incorporate African spirituality into it and African ancient fighting systems. So we developed my Samu. Um, and it's, a, it's what you would call, I don't call it, but the closest thing to it would be what you would call a mixed martial arts system. And that okay. it's it, it stand up, which is your karate your um, Muay Thai, it's grappling defenses, which is your jiu-jitsu or your judo, it's throws, it's also mm-hmm. weapons defenses, which is your Krav Maga or any type of um, uh, lethal defensive systems, um, you know, it's, it's your tactical systems, it incorporated all of those, and I, I had the honor over the years of teaching, uh, it's in the thousands, I don't know... I don't have a count of how many people I've taught, but it's in the thousands, and most of them have been women. And, bro, I taught some women that, you know, kick the average brother's ass, you know, if they have to. Right, right. And, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know I was using that type of language on the show. But, no, you um, good. You good. We curse. <laughs> yeah, I taught some sisters. So I had these sisters that, this group of sisters that trained with me for years. And so brothers mm-hmm. come to um, into the session, like you know, some really big dudes. Like I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm five nine, maybe five nine and a half. Uh, I'm one ninety, fit, you know, uh, muscle, mm-hmm. muscle frame, right? But I get some brothers come in like six five, six six, like think they're gonna dominate, right? 
knowing that right. I could like like within seconds like destabilize these brothers. I was like, you know what? Nah, I was like, you go ahead, go to the center of the floor with that sister right there. <laughs> and yeah. so they go football play, and every single time they would get choked out by the sisters, no question about it. And so what happens is that, like, when you get a man who gets choked out by a woman, you know what he wants to do. He's saying, oh, mm-hmm. I'm going to